always thought a low fat diet was the way to go. Saturated fat was always the enemy because it raises your cholesterol. And then there was a big war on this good old salt because it raises your blood pressure. But now it seems something that's been innocently lurking in our cupboards for centuries is the new public enemy number one. It's sugar. And you know what? I don't really know why, so I'm going to go and find out. I'm Fiona Phillips, and like most of us, I love my sweet treats. But I want to discover the latest science about what sugar is really doing to us. This is part of the brain that reacts when you have sugary foods and sugary drinks. And why you might be eating far more than you think. Oh, that is a lot of sugar. I'll be uncovering how you can spot the sugar in foods you'd think were sugar-free. Nearly nine and a half what? teaspoons. 20 teaspoons <laughs> in that bottle. <laughs> how clever cookery can get sweet results without adding sugar. Oh, it's really delicious. Yeah. And revealing the sugars that even doctors say you can enjoy guilt-free. You do like oranges? I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find out the surprising and very sticky truth about sugar. Wow! We Brits love our sugar. It's one of life's great pleasures. And we're getting through over a million tonnes a year. That's 15 teaspoons each a day. There's no getting away from it. That's more than we should be eating. I'm meeting up with four rather brave volunteers in Newcastle. I'm going to start by showing them how much sugar each of them is getting through every week. We've got a table each. See if you can pick your table out. You already have. Yeah, that's me. Sweet. That's terrible. They all suspect they might have too sweet a tooth and want to do something about it. So I'm asking them to cut back to just six teaspoons a day, a target the World Health Organization believes is the best to aim at. First up is Cara Patterson. Here's Cara's table. It is predominantly brown. Yes. <laughs> Lots of chocolate. I even know that you eat chocolate for breakfast. I do, yeah. <laughs> chocolate and coffee. Cara Patterson splits her time between working at a school and being home looking after her four-year-old son, Noah. Sit next to my mum. That an order. She worries that sugar is taking over her life. I'm definitely addicted to sugar. I crave it. The worst time that I want sugar is as soon as I wake up. Um, breakfast always contains something sweet, whether it's cakes, biscuits, chocolate. Well, Cara, your average daily sugar intake was 28 teaspoons. 28 teaspoons a day. A day. That's not good, is it? So, Cara's eating nearly five times the six teaspoons a day target that I want her to aim for. This is going to mean some big changes for her. Ah, you may well look nervous, Rick. Rick Shabilla comes from a Sikh family with a history of type 2 diabetes. He worries that his love of sugary Indian sweets could land him in the same boat. They're so colourful and they look so innocent, but they are little, little assassins. You've got your Indian desserts, which we know are very high in sugars. Yeah, these are normally accompanied with some ice cream. Um, which would be adding more, even more sugars. More. I think, Pauline, you should do the honours, or would you like to reveal your sugar consumption? No. You please. want Pauline to do it, guess. OK. 29 teaspoons per day. A day. A day. A day. That's really terrifying, to be honest. Like Cara, Rick is also nearly five times over where I want him to be. Audrey Cannon feels her weight is getting out of control. A life on the road as an acquisitions manager has led to a diet of processed food and sugary snacks. 
I'll be going to meetings and things and coming out to meetings and jumping straight in the car. It's just as easy for me to eat in the car as it is to stop off and have something because I just want to get home sometimes. You're having quite a few supermarket ready meals. Mm -hmm. We've got a chilli beef here. Mm -hmm. That contains five teaspoons of sugar in half the pack, mm -hmm. which is a portion. I wouldn't even think to look at the sugar content. I would maybe look at the calories or the fat, yes. but I've never, ever thought mm -hmm. of looking at sugar. Mm -hmm. Your average daily intake was 23 teaspoons. Oh, dear. So, to be on target, Audrey's going to have to cut pretty well three quarters of the sugar from her diet. Simon Gallagher loves his fizzy pop. That's so cold. But at 26 stone, he's becoming increasingly worried about his health. On a normal day, I'd have three or four cans of fizzy drink. If I'm at home, it can be pretty much any amount until I feel like sick, basically, or until I haven't got any left. Simon, you're smiling now. Yeah, out of nerves. The problem is that you have a huge amount of sugar. As it stands, you're having a whopping 39 teaspoons of sugar every day. That's yeah, that's a lot. Just to reiterate, this is 57 kilos per year, or 14,000 teaspoons of sugar that you're putting into your body. Simon is six and a half times over and will have to make the biggest changes of all. Although current guidelines suggest we should aim at less than 12 teaspoons of sugar a day, the World Health Organization thinks if we can reduce this to six, it would have even bigger health benefits. It's going to be a tough target for my volunteers, but I'm hoping the more I can learn about sugar, the more I can help them cut back. The sugars we need to be looking out for are known as free sugars. These include the sugars found in honey, syrups and fruit juices. But the main culprit is refined sugar we add to food. But what does refining sugar actually involve? And why does it make it a potential health problem? Biologist Dr Marty Jobson is going to help me find out. This is one piece of sugar cane, I've cut it in half. Beautiful looking thing. So it's a huge grass that grows down in the tropics and yeah. this stuff is packed full of sugar. And the way we get it out is the first thing we have to do is we need to break it down a bit. So here, look, have a mallet. Crunchy. And what I want you to do is Where just do sort I of... Start? Can, any way you want. Start at that end, yeah. OK? That's it. OK, OK, OK. I think you've enjoyed that far too much. I did, I'll actually. I burned all my you. calories off, too. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you this bowl. You need to go around there and okay. catch the juice ah. as it comes out of the mango. Here we go. Easier said than done, Marty. Yeah, there's some spluttering out there. All sugars are natural and come from plants. Are you all right there? Yes. <laughs> sugar cane and sugar beet are used in sugar production as they have particularly high concentrations. All this refining is designed to make that concentration even higher. We've safely delivered of some sugary juice down here. OK. Carbon dioxide is then used to remove impurities like wax, gum and fat, all with the aim of giving us pure, refined sugar. That's it. And now we just have to boil it down. So what we have now is a thick mm -hmm. syrup. We leave that to cool and the sugar will start to crystallise out. And what you'll end up with is this, which is what I made earlier, which is... Refined sugar. Refined sugar. It? There's a lot of treacle there as well. Yeah. But that mm. is incredibly sweet. Mm. However, there's not that much of it, is there, considering it came from all of this bulk here and all the effort it took to get it out. Yes, exactly. What We're, we're going to throw away all of this, this roughage and fibre. So what you're left with here is essentially pure calories. 
So the refined sugar that we use at home has basically had all the fibre and roughage stripped away to become pure energy. And Marty wants to show me just how much energy there is in the four grams of sugar that make up a level teaspoon. I've taken a teaspoon, a level teaspoon, a level mind teaspoon, you, yeah. of icing sugar and put one in each of these tubes. We've got two teaspoons of sugar. You take those, okay. put them on okay. first. And what we're going to do is blow down these tubes. Blow, right. mind you. Uh -huh. Count of three. Uh -huh. Three, two, one. Wow! <laughs> so all that energy in one level teaspoon of sugar. Exactly. That's the energy you get if you eat it as well. It's the same amount of energy. The flames may look impressive, but this energy is the real danger of sugar. If you don't burn it off, it can make you fat very quickly. But I had no idea just how quickly. Imagine, say, you're drinking three cups of tea a day. OK. OK, you put two teaspoons of sugar in yeah. every cup, yeah. 365 days. Now, imagine you're also not burning off that. How much of my lovely fat substitute yeah. would you end up in your artificial belly if all of your sugar that you put into your tea was turned into fat and it wasn't burnt off? Six teaspoons a day for a whole year and I didn't burn it off. Correct. Okay. How many of these? One of those, do you reckon? One, one of those? Let's, let's try one. OK, let's do one. Sugar is one of the cheapest forms of calories. It's not just bad for your teeth, if you have too much, your liver will end up turning it into fatty acids that your body will store as fat. It feels really uncomfortable. So this is the second of my bottles. OK. More? It's... I don't want more, but... It's... There is more, I'm afraid. Oh, my goodness. There we go. We're getting there, we're getting there. So what you've got there is four and a half kilos of fat, that's over half a stone. I know, I can feel it. <laughs> and all because of your six teaspoons of sugar that you were having every day for a whole year that were excess to what you need. I mean, a sweet tooth like that can lead to weight problems which could be seriously dangerous. If just a few excess calories from sugar can cause issues over time, what have high sugar diets done to my four volunteers? At Newcastle University, Professor Mike Trenell is going to find out. One of the problems with sugar is it allows you to take large amounts of calories on very quickly, which can make you obese. Mike uses high-tech equipment to measure the body fat percentage of my four volunteers. So at the moment, 51% of your body is fat. Really? Wow. That's a lot. Mm. It's half of my body weight. All four have levels that are higher than they should be, and it's this body fat that can lead to health problems. Gaining weight can link to heart disease, diabetes and other long-term conditions. And further tests show that my volunteers are already in danger. The background of high sugar, high body fat, is going to place more and more stress on your liver, on your muscles, but mainly on the pancreas. And over time, if you don't do something, you'll be having to take insulin through an injection, which is what happens with people when they have type 2 diabetes for a long period of time. And for Simon, excess fat has led to signs of a potentially fatal disease. Now, when your liver has too much food inside of it, it starts to have this long, silent scream, which is indicating to us that you have a condition called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if unless you do something, it's very likely that you're going to go on to develop type 2 diabetes. Then I'll do something. Sugar doesn't directly cause conditions like type 2 diabetes and liver disease, but because it's so energy rich, along with other carbohydrates and fat, it is one of the things most likely to increase your body fat, and it's this fat that will do the damage. 
Time for my four volunteers to start cutting back. I'd like you to try and get down to six teaspoons of sugar a day, which, if some of you, it's going to mean losing 80% of what you're consuming sugar-wise at the moment. It's a tough challenge. Do you think you can do it? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. It's very positive. Good. While they're finding out the reality of cutting back, I'm going to be looking at three of the main sources of refined sugar in their diet to see what they're up against. Sweet treats. For most of us, these are the biggest challenge. I want to uncover the science behind why we crave them. Savoury foods. Why is the food industry putting sugar in products that we'd assume are completely sugar-free? And what is it that fizzy drinks do to our appetite that means some scientists say they're the biggest problem of all? I can't think about anybody but sugar. Sugar, so I can't think about anybody but you. We eat more biscuits than any other country in Europe. And sweet treats are where we Brits get most of our sugar from. I can't think about anybody else but you. Anybody else but you. So for our volunteers, these have to be the first things to go. But how tough will that be? It's the Sikh equivalent of Christmas Day, and there's a big celebration in the local temple, a source of great temptation for Rick. This is Guru Nanak Dev Ji's uh, Gurpra, which is a celebration of the, the birth of our first guru. This is our Christmas, if you will. So there's a lot of sugary sweets and treats to celebrate this event. This is torture. <laughs> That's sugar written in pretty much pure sugar. Deep fried and then dipped in syrup. It doesn't get any better, but it also doesn't get any more cruel than that. <laughs> but Rick is being a good boy. So far, he hasn't put anything sweet on his tray. But does that change the celebration? Like Christmas Day without the pudding. This is actually quite a, it's quite a big deal. It's been quite challenging. The, the guy's teasing me doesn't help. <laughs> Meanwhile, Kara is really struggling. Her husband, Rob, is refusing to dump the sweet treats. Right, I'm just going to sh uh, shove all my stuff over there so that you've got the... your stuff and I've got the stuff with less sugar in. So they're arranging their cupboards into his and hers. For someone who craves sugar, this is asking for trouble. But Kara is determined to fight temptation. She really wants to kick her sweet habit for the sake of her son, Noah. He's the ultimate motivation because I want to be around for him as he gets older. I don't want to be a burden. I want to be able to do things with him. I don't want sugar to be haunting us in 20 years' time. But there's one thing that's holding Kara back, cravings that she just can't beat. Did cave in last night and had a bar of galaxy. Um, no one knows. But why do some of us like Kara get really strong cravings for sugar? I'm taking her to Reading University to find out. Neuroscientists here have been studying what happens to the brain when you eat sugar. And to see what's going on in Kara's head, she's being put into an MRI scanner that monitors brain activity. Kara is given sugar in the form of a sweet drink, and changes in her brain are picked up by the scanner. OK, so, Cara, this is an image of your brain that we just took when you were in the scanner. This is a structural image. And on this, we can see parts of the brain that we know to be involved in the reward system. So, for example, here we have the striatum. And this is a part of the brain that reacts when you have very pleasant experiences, like when you eat things that you really like, like sugary um, foods and sugary drinks. 
And so um, if we look at this uh, image over here, this time you can see the actual activity in this part. So that is the reward center. And that's the brain saying, mm, this is really, really nice. Wouldn't mind some more of that. So Clara can happily keep feeding herself sweet things and the brain will make her feel better. Mm -hmm. What do you think seeing this? So it's out. really interesting because often I crave like sweet things but a lot of the time no matter how much I eat of them the craving's still there and I still want more. Yeah, we are hardwired and biologically driven to seek out energy dense foods. So all of us have a prime evil urge to, to seek high energy foods and our brains are telling us that. Yeah. Everybody um, likes sugary sweet things because it's a, a natural drive. What differentiates people who overconsume those foods from people who don't? Um, we don't know what the biological differences are behind that yet. So a sweet thing's habit forming then? If you have more brain activity underlying this um, craving or this uh, reward seeking behavior, then you're going to repeat it and that makes sense. So that is, a, that is like a habit, yeah. So, there you have it. That is why sugar is so hard to give up. We are hardwired to enjoy it, to seek it out. And that was okay in ancient times, I guess, when food shortages meant that high-energy, sugary foods were literally the difference between life and death. But things have changed now, and sweet, cheap, sugary foods are all around us. And that is not good for us, and frankly, our DNA really isn't helping. If your brain is egging you on to have a sweet treat, are there any that are better than others? I am confused as to whether any of this stuff might be better for you than ordinary white sugar. Right, well, let's have a look. Here we go. You'll often hear that honey is good for you, that brown sugar is healthier than white, and that maple syrup is not part of the sugar debate. But what's the truth? So essentially, all of these are the same. They are all from natural sugars from plants, refined in different ways. So it doesn't make any difference which one you use. It's all just sugar. I did not know that. I thought that if I put a teaspoon of honey in my tea, it would be much better for me than a teaspoon of white sugar. Brown sugar simply has a bit of molasses in it and has roughly the same calories as white refined sugar. And a level teaspoon of honey in your tea will actually have more calories than a level teaspoon of sugar because it has more nutrients and is denser. So there's no getting away from it. None of these forms of sugar are particularly good for you. But there is some better news. One of the surprising truths about sugar is that if you do want a sweet treat, scientists say that fruit is the answer. That's because the naturally occurring sugar fruit contains comes with so much goodness, like vitamins, minerals and fibre, that it doesn't count towards your recommended daily allowance. But sugar in supermarkets isn't just limited to sweet treats, it's actually in quite a few savoury products as well, and often with a lot more sugar than you'd think. I've got a bowl of pad thai noodles here. Okay. It's a savoury dish, obviously, mm. so what do you reckon, sugar-wise? Well, not that much, I think. If you'd like to spoon in, what do you think? Two teaspoons of sugar in that yeah. dish. OK, you're a bit under there, because, in fact, there are... Oh, stop. <laughs> Nearly nine and a half what? teaspoons of that sugar. That has nine and a half. Uh-huh. I'm eating those things, no. <laughs> That's probably more than a, a dessert. It's not just ready meals that can have added sugar. What about one of the healthier, apparently savoury, breakfast cereals? So, brown flakes, dry, <laughs> not very appetising. <laughs> <laughs> but how many teaspoons of sugar, if you would expect any at all to be in that? One teaspoon. Just the one. Yeah. Just the one. OK. Right, I can tell you that there are, in fact, oh three teaspoons 
That's horrendous. Yeah. Because I have that because I think that's the healthier choice. And it doesn't end there. This pack of sweet and sour chicken with rice contains 12 and a half teaspoons of sugar. And there's over six teaspoons of sugar in this can of baked beans. Ideally, that would be your entire sugar intake for one day. I'm really surprised how much sugar is in some of our supposedly savoury foods. I want to know why manufacturers are adding it. So I'm visiting an international research facility in Surrey where scientists are employed by manufacturers to help them create the perfect products. So what have we got here, Alice? I presume it's soup. It's tomato soup, and we've got two different recipes of tomato soup here. One's got no sugar in it, and just a little bit of sugar in the other. So I'd like you to taste them, see what you think. OK, right, so we'll start with this one, I think. Mm. I'm not sure about. Mm. Mm. That one. Okay. Yes, that was it. Mm. This okay. Was it. Mm. Okay. Well, that one's got a little bit of sugar in it, which I think is interesting because just a tiny amount can change the taste profile and actually make it taste a bit better sometimes. It actually tastes delicious and good. it brings out the taste of the tomatoes okay. to me. Okay. That's good. That's good. It's tomato but, soup. But is that a good thing? Mm -hmm. Isn't that then what the manufacturers are doing? Making people like it with sugar in, and so they eat more, they buy more, but they're also getting bigger as well. Well, they do want to make things that people like at the end of the day. In fairness to the manufacturers, many are already making attempts to reduce the amount of sugar in their products, and it certainly isn't just the case of the more sugar you put in, the more you'll sell. Scientists here are experts at finding the precise degree of sugariness which will appeal to customers, the so-called bliss point. Today we've got nine testers who are here behind us. Um, all sitting behind these All hatches. sitting behind these little screens. And we have five different recipes of tomato soup, going from those that have very little sugar in them to a little bit more and then a little bit more, and actually to a stage where some consumers might find it too sweet. Uh -huh. And the purpose of this exercise is to find that recipe that the majority of them will like. So what other products would you test in terms of its sweetness or, or added sugar? Oh, a huge range of products. I mean, everything from yogurts or cheese or milk to ready meals or drinks or confectionery. So, Alice, our tasters have emerged from their hatches. They've tasted their soups. What happens next? OK, so we're here in our viewing facility. We can see them, but they can't see us, so this is a one-way mirror, ah. OK? So we can listen in on the sort of things that they're saying about our tomato soups. And in a moment, they'll vote on which one they think has got just the right level of sweetness in it. So let's start off with sample 341, please. Can you raise your hand if you prefer that sample? Oh, that's interesting. Look, nobody's voted for the one with no sugar. Uh, and 646, please. One, four two, votes four. for the three, three percent sugar. That's the mid range, isn't it? And uh, finally, what about seven six three? Okay, so that's two. And two votes for the six for the percent six. sugar. So the three percent is the winner. That's the one they prefer. And that sort of information for oh. the manufacturer of a savoury food uh -huh. is is priceless, really. Absolutely, yes. Well, I have to say, I'm really surprised that there's so much science behind the exact amount of sugar that's being put into our foods. Of course, ultimately, it's done to make the food taste nicer, so we buy it and it's good for business. So the question we need to ask ourselves, really, is if manufacturers started taking sugar out of foods, would we still buy their products? All this sugar in savoury food is making life difficult for acquisitions manager Audrey Cannon. With such a busy lifestyle, she's come to depend on fast food and ready meals. But with a history of heart disease in the family, she's determined to kick the habit. I just got in from work 
and normally I would cook um, some processed food uh, such as these barbecue wedges and as you can see they've got a lot of barbecue sauce but when I checked on the label they had three spoonfuls of sugar in and I was astounded I didn't realise so I'm going to make my own. Trying to get her sugar consumption down means Audrey is completely rethinking her food choices. It's been a big wake-up call to see how much sugar's in what I feel are healthy foods. But it's made the weekly shop a real headache. I haven't really found it difficult in what I've been eating. The difficulty is being in what to buy and looking at the sugar content as I've been going around the supermarket. That's been the biggest challenge. Audrey's not the only one to struggle with food labelling. I do too. So how can we know when a product is high in sugar? Right, there's a lot of shopping here. The traffic light system, which is the front of packet system, is great because you can see at a glance if something is red, amber or green for, for different nutrients. So take these um, sweet and sour chicken dishes. All of these are red for sugars on the front. High sugar value means that it's got over 22 and a half grams in 100 grams of product. Traffic lights make it easy, but manufacturers aren't legally obliged to use them. Some don't, and some also choose to indicate the sugar content of a portion rather than per 100 grams. If you take, for example, this pack of crunchy nut cornflakes, you do have some nutritional information on the front of the packet, but it's not colour-coded, so you can't see at a glance no, how much sugar's can't. in that. <laughs> With products like this, consumers have to examine the pack to find the information that some dietitians argue is the most useful. If you really want to know how much sugar was in this, you could turn to the back of the pack, and here we can see for, for sugars, it's 35 grams. So that's high sugar because it contains sugar. more than 22 and a half grams per 100 grams. So mm. it's a sugary cereal. This type of supermarket homework is particularly revealing with savoury products that you might have thought were sugar-free. You'll see how much sugar it contains, 22.8 grams per 100 grams. So it's a high sugar product. Something that you'd have on your chips, so you, you, which you wouldn't associate with sugar. Yeah, something you? that That's you it. think was savoury. Yeah. Yes. With some products labelled per 100 grams and some per portion, and not everyone using the traffic light system, I want to know why food manufacturers aren't making sugar content much easier for us. So I'm off to see the Food and Drink Federation, which represents the industry. Do you think that if all food producers were made to adhere to the traffic light system, it might help? Because that, to me, is clearer than all the other systems that exist. Well, I think that there isn't a, a, a single solution for a problem uh, such as obesity that is so complex. But the traffic light system would help, wouldn't it? Because if you see a red next to the sugar content, I, that would make me put it down. The information that is available on PAC, uh, whether it's through the uh, reference intakes values, uh, whether it's through the traffic light system, is clear and is accurate. Do you not think it would be a a whole lot clearer if the packets showed how many teaspoons of sugar, then everyone would understand that. The reason for uh, the uh, amount of sugar is, uh, uh, to be labelled per 100 grams uh, or per portion in grams uh, is, uh, again, in the Food Information to Consumers regulation, where all nutrients are treated the same. And uh, a gram is a very well-recognised unit when, uh, if you talk about teaspoons or tablespoons, what do you think, four, five, six grams? Well, it very firmly seems as though all the regulation, all the information on the packets, most of which most of us can't make much sense of, it's all there for a reason. It's, it's to educate us, it's to make sure we make the right choices. But in the end, it is the responsibility is all left to us. And I don't think, with the amount of sugar they're putting in some foodstuffs, that that is right. I really don't. I think that more owners should be taken by the manufacturers. Added sugar in processed food means the best way ready meal aficionado Audrey can get her sugar intake down to just six teaspoons a day is to cook everything from scratch. But after a day on the road, it's a daunting prospect. The time's about half past six. 
and I've just gone in from work and I've now got to think about um, what I'm going to have for tea. So I'm feeling a bit sort of frustrated that I can't just come in and cook something easy and I've got to prepare and think about it and have plenty of ingredients in the house when really all I want to do is come in, have my tea and sit and, and chill. But is there a way for Audrey to have the taste advantages of sugar and savoury food in a healthier way and without too much hard work? I've set nutritionist Christine Bailey this challenge. Audrey, you're partial to the old ready meal, aren't you? So what tips have you got, first of all, about ready meals, supermarket ready meals, what to avoid? Well, as you know, a lot of them contain sugar, but particularly, I would say, the shop-bought sauces, things like, you know, the tomato ketchups, the sweet chilli sauce, baked beans, and sweet and sour sauce. The answer, it seems, is fruit. Remember, sugar in fruit doesn't count towards your daily allowance, so we're cooking a sweet and sour sauce using the natural sweetness of chunks of pineapple to replace refined sugar. And to give it more kick without the calories, just add spices. We're going to actually add, I've got here some chilli, um, some garlic. You're doing the ginger. Um, I'm going to use some onion as well. And I'm also going to add just a little bit of Chinese five spice, which has that um, lovely sort of oriental flavour to it. Throw in some onion, pepper and soy sauce, and we have a low-sugar sweet sauce, to which we could later add a bit of chicken or maybe prawns. Mmm, that is delicious. You could use that as a ketchup pan. alternative. Audrey, you and your busy life. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is simple, isn't it? It is, because I could just have this ready and then just cook the chicken when I get home. It's yeah. Just boil some rice, it would be really easy. Well, you could bulk cook it, couldn't you? Yeah. And put batches and freeze it, yep. and whip it out when you get home. Yep. For Audrey, it's problem solved. Mm. It's nice. Gosh, that tastes sweet as mm. well. Mm. No wonder you're smiling. <laughs> Can't wait to get home and have it. It's <laughs> really delicious. Yeah. There's another source of sugar, though, that many of us enjoy. It's this, fizzy drinks. Is drinking sugar the same as eating it? Well, according to some scientists, the answer is no. Drinks can have a shocking amount of sugar in them, and they're one of the quickest and easiest ways to see your sugar consumption soar. I've got a bottle of ginger beer here for you. And it is your favourite, is it? I want you to put the number of teaspoons you think are in this bottle of ginger beer into that little pot, please. That's eight teaspoons. Eight. Yeah. That is a lot. I know, but... But it's nowhere near, oh, actually. Oh, you're kidding! <laughs> I have that every week. <laughs> it's no laughing matter. <laughs> oh, no. You're kidding. You I'm not kidding. kidding. 20 teaspoons <laughs> in that bottle. <laughs> now, don't pass out on me, please. Fantastic. <laughs> That's not fantastic. <laughs> and that's not all. This one-and-a-half-litre bottle of strawberry-flavoured water contains 18 teaspoons of sugar. This 750-millilitre bottle of elderflower sparkling water, 13 teaspoons. And this half-litre bottle of sports drink, 15 teaspoons of sugar. Most orange juice doesn't have any added sugar, but it still counts towards your daily allowance. When you juice a fruit, you're getting most of the sugar without much of the fibre or bulk. So a glass of juice can be packed with far more sugar than you might think. But how aware are we of this? I would like you to ladle into my little bowl there the number of teaspoons of sugar you think might be in this drink. OK. All right, I'll definitely yeah. one. <laughs> okay. I want to say it's healthy because it's juice, but I know that there is sugar in juice. Two teaspoons of sugar. Four, four and a half, five. Okay, two. Well, I can tell you it is 
But when it comes to sugar, what's the difference between eating oranges and drinking orange juice? Well, it has a lot to do with the amount of sugar you can consume in a very short time. I'm back to meet Marty to find out more. Maggie, in front of you, you have a litre of orange juice, which is made from 12 oranges. And in front of you, Kanika, we have 12 oranges. And what we want you to do is we want you to, well, eat or drink what you've got in front of you as much as you can. It's not a race. We just want to, you to eat or drink until you feel you've had enough. OK? okay. So, are you ready? Yes. Yeah. Away you go. Thank you. OK. You do like oranges? I do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, you're done. That's it, mm -hmm. you're full, yeah. And Maggie's still going. Maggie's still going? Mm. So, Maggie, you've drunk, what, three quarters of a litre? Yeah. Of orange juice? And Kanika, you've had... One and a half. One and a half yeah. oranges. Mm -hmm. So, what does that mean? What does that girls? mean? What does yeah. that actually mean? Right. Yeah. Well, Maggie, you have just drunk approximately 18 teaspoons of sugar. Wow, OK. OK, whereas you have had maybe three, three and a half, something like that, teaspoons okay. of sugar mm -hmm. in that. And that's the thing. The reason you've managed to eat less mm. is because the orange is full of fibre as well. It's chock full of fibre. There's got two things it does. First of all, it keeps you satisfied. It fills you up yeah. much more than the orange juice does. The thing is, you can't eat as much sort of oranges as you can orange juice. I mean, you couldn't eat nine oranges or 12 oranges, could you? Not in a day. And the second thing it does is it actually makes the sugar that you have eaten release very slowly into your blood. OK, so there are benefits, despite the fact that fruit has got sugar in, there are benefits for eating fruit. Definitely. Fruit, full of fibre, vitamins, it's great for you. Fruit juice, on the other hand, you just, you know, in moderation, it's good for you, but just be aware of the sugar that's in it. So, without realising it, not only has Meggie managed to drink five times the sugar that Kanika has eaten, it'll get into her bloodstream super fast, causing a sugar rush. the Copper Box Arena in London's Olympic Park. Two netball teams are helping us with a fascinating experiment which gets to the very heart of the truth about sugary drinks, their effect on appetite. Some drinks can have as many calories in them as a meal, but will these liquid sugar calories fill you up like eating food well? Dr Jason Gill from the University of Glasgow Medical School is going to help me find out. So, what's the experiment about, Jason? Okay, the experiment today is all about sugar in drinks. We've got two netball teams here. We're going to give one of them a drink with sugar after the, after the game, and we're going to give the other group a sugar-free version of the same drink. And then we're going to give them an all-you-can-eat buffet and see how much food they choose to eat at that. Okay, so then I would guess that the team that's given the drink with sugar in would therefore eat the less food? That's, that's what you'd think. We're going to see whether that's actually the case. So do they eat fewer calories because they've already consumed some calories in the drink beforehand? OK. So we've got the red ones for the red team and the blue ones for the blue team. And all I want you to do is take a bottle and drink all of it before you leave the court. So if you'd like to help yourself... Help yourself. What the red team doesn't know is that they're guzzling sugary blackcurrant squash, which is packed full of calories. The blue team, equally unknowing, are drinking no calories at all. But will the red team, consuming all those extra calories through drink, eat less than the team that has had zero? When the girls have had their fill, they're asked to leave the room. 
And while they're out, we carefully weigh everything left on the table to calculate the amount of calories each team has consumed. They're in for a shock. We gave you these two drinks beforehand, but you didn't know that this drink had sugar in it, and that was a sugar-free version of the same drink. <laughs> And then we had you at this buffet and we, we, we weighed out all the food beforehand, we weighed out what you had at the end and we calculated how many calories you consumed. And this table consumed a thousand calories in total more than this table. <laughs> and that's entirely because of the sugar content in the drink, that's the difference. Yeah, the difference is the sugar in the drink. So what happens is when you drink the sugar in the drink, you consume the calories very easily, but your body doesn't really sense them very well, so they, they don't make you feel full. So when you go to eat, you don't eat any less food because the calories don't make you feel full from the drink that you had beforehand. So what does that mean in terms of obesity? Well, we know that sugar-sweetened drinks are a big determinant of obesity. The fact that you're drinking lots of these drinks is one of the big things that's responsible for the fact that we're all getting fatter, particularly children. <laughs> People who have lots of sugar in their diets do tend to put on weight. And that's partly because the calories in sugary things, especially sugary drinks, aren't the best for making you feel full. So you're more likely to carry on eating and therefore take on more calories. Simon used to down up to seven cans of fizzy drink a day and the calories in them have been a contributing factor to him developing fatty liver disease. He's been trying to go cold turkey and not drink any fizzy pop at all, but he appears to be having withdrawal symptoms. I have been a bit more tired than usual, but I expect that's probably more likely to do with the fact that I'm not wired permanently from sugar, which I was, clearly. I feel, I feel a little bit on edge at the minute. Twitchy, sort of, yeah. My attention span isn't as good. And Simon isn't alone with his habit. Your average Brit gets through 50 litres of sugary drink in a year. So I'm back at Leatherhead Food Lab to see what that really means and whether there's an alternative. This is what 50 litres of water looks like. And this is the amount of sugar you have to add to make it as sweet as your average soft drink. Nearly five and a half kilos. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, my goodness me. All that sugar. That's sweet. Very sweet. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I feel it sticking to my teeth. Yeah, it's, that is sweet. We're going to swap that tub of water for another one. Now, let's try an experiment. OK, so we have the same amount of water here, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put in 10 grams of this artificial sweetener, sucralose, so I'll chuck it in, we'll okay. see what it tastes like. Chuck it in there. OK. Yeah. All of it's in. That's mixing up. Right, Alice, it's time for us to taste this strange concoction Thank now. You. That's yours. Right. Oh, gosh, that's definitely as sweet as the sugar one. Yeah. And yet, all that sugar that went into the other one, 5.4 kilos and 10 grams of your artificial sweetener. 10 grams of the sucralose, that's because it's 500 times sweeter than the sugar that we used. But the only thing that would make alarm bells ring with a lot of people is it is an artificial sweetener. Along with artificial sweeteners comes all sorts of stories of it links to ill health, well, it is a sweetener, but all of the sweeteners are rigorously tested and they're very tightly regulated. They are tested and tested and tested, and it takes years to develop a sweetener for use in food, so we have to be very, very sure that they are safe to use in food before we'd be allowed to use them. 
Artificial sweeteners undergo meticulous testing by scientists, which is then reviewed by the European Food Safety Authority before they can be used in food and drink. And leading scientific groups like Cancer Research UK say there's strong evidence that they are safe for humans. Although the debate rages on, the science seems to indicate that the 20,000 calories consumed by the average Brit in a year from sugary drinks are much more likely to cause you health issues than a tiny amount of replacement sweetener. Our four volunteers are reaching the end of their low sugar diet and they're coming up with their own solutions. Former fizzy drink junkie Simon has been trying out fruit teas and flavouring water with large chunks of fruit. Eventually, through trial and error, he's made the breakthrough. Lemon, mint, it is really, really refreshing. It tastes like a sensation compared to normal water. Just by cutting out the fizzy drinks, Simon has dramatically reduced his sugar intake and he thinks he can feel the benefits already. When your pants are falling down in public, that's a good sign of, that you've lost weight and that has happened. Audrey has become the home cooking queen, preparing everything she eats from scratch and using the internet to track down more sugar-free fast food like do-it-yourself hummus. Basically, you just open a can of chickpeas, add a few things to it and put it in a blender. Totally homemade hummus. And it's absolutely delicious. What do you think? Okay, slip. No sugar? Rick is doing well. He has completely stopped eating sugary treats during the day, but is consoling himself with a bit more nighttime cheer, relaxing down the pub over a couple of pints and hoping he'll still make the grade. And self-confessed sugar addict Cara, she's cut out the biscuits, the cake and sweets through sheer willpower. There is going to be things that come up like Noah's birthday where I'm going to have cake and I'm going to have sweet stuff. But I can deal with those days now whereas before, that would have been every day rather than just one day. After six weeks, our low sugar experiment is over and my volunteers are back at Newcastle University for the same series of tests they had at the start. Rick has gone from eating 29 teaspoons of sugar a day to seven, narrowly missing out on his six a day target, but still well within current guidelines. Okay, so if you can step on the scale for me. Cara, however, is down from 28 teaspoons a day to just three. Audrey from 23 teaspoons to a quarter of a teaspoon. And Simon has gone from a massive 39 teaspoons of sugar a day to just a quarter of a teaspoon. All four were at risk of heart disease and type 2 diabetes. So what has their new low sugar regime done to their health? Cara and Audrey's results are very similar. The headline of it all is that you've lost just over six kilos in weight, or just over a stone. Right. So you've lost about five kilos, which is nearly a stone. So well done. Thank you. The changes that you've made to your diet by reducing sugar mm -hmm. have substantially reduced your risks of mm -hmm. conditions like heart disease and type 2 diabetes, as well as the wonderful things that it's done for your metabolism. When you first came through, we were looking quite a lot at how your body was processing the sugar. Yeah. And I'm pleased to be able to tell you that from the blood sugar results that we've taken, you've improved hugely, which is relieving a lot of the stress on your pancreas. So Cara and Audrey have dramatically improved their health by cutting back on sugar. Rick, however, despite not eating any Indian sweets, hasn't lost any weight at all. Rick, you have substantially reduced the amount of sugar you take in from 29 spoonfuls down to seven. Mm -hmm. But at that same time, you've increased your alcohol intake. 
And so any benefits that you would have had mm -hmm. from reducing your sugar are taken away because you're taking in more alcohol. Mm -hmm. Got it, yeah. The volunteer Mike was most concerned about was Simon. He was showing signs of potentially fatal fatty liver disease. His challenge was the greatest of all. You've managed to lose just over six kilos, which is just over a stone. Well done. Good. Now, I'm pleased to tell you that the markers that we had for fatty liver disease have gone down by 40 to 70 percent. Good. Wow. That's that was the most... more than good. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was the most concerning thing. And I couldn't be prouder of you. Well done. Thanks very much. It's been a huge challenge. But for all four of our volunteers, it's just the start of a whole new lifestyle. I'm really proud of myself and I'm definitely going to continue with it. I feel now that I'm kind of sick into myself of sweet stuff. It's, it seems bizarre, but like, is it worth risking my health for a bar of chocolate? Yes, you can socialise, you can be a Sikh, be Indian, be a Jory and cut out the sugar. You can, you just, you just got to be a little bit more aware and not given to the peer and social pressures that are there. Just something that I really need to do. Obviously, I have a long way to go, but um, because the first steps are the most difficult ones, I'm already moving that way, so I'll continue. If you were to come back and see me in a year's time, I would be half the man I am now. I've actually gone down two dress sizes. I don't mind going shopping and buying new clothes. Um, I absolutely have no problem uh, putting in the charity bag because I'm never going to wear them again because I'm never going to be like that again. The truth about sugar is that it can pile on the pounds frighteningly quickly and all that extra weight can lead to a whole host of very serious health problems. It isn't the only culprit. Too much of most foods will make you fat. But I think sugar is the thing many of us tend to binge on. Your body craves it, and it often doesn't fill you up. While most things we know are OK in moderation, with sugar, we really do seem hardwired.